This is Market Pathways, your premium guide to global medical device regulation, reimbursement, and policy. Become a part of the global medtech community at mystrategist.com. Welcome to another edition of the Market Pathways podcast. I'm Steve Levin, Editor-in-Chief of Market Pathways and MedTech Strategist. And as always, we're happy to have you join us for another session of the podcast. And today's discussion focuses on reimbursement, an issue that has become top of mind to most MedTech executives, globally, both small companies and large companies, but also to investors. And what makes this podcast, I think, particularly timely is that it's an interview with Mike Carusi, and Mike is a veteran medtech investor, currently with Lightstone Ventures and having previously been with ATV, Advanced Technology Ventures. And Mike has been involved in trying to promote the importance of reimbursement and regulatory issues for a long time. And at a time when reimbursement was really not seen as relevant, both on the company side and on the investor side compared with the way it's viewed today. And Mike was one of the early promoters of the importance of both regulatory and reimbursement and has testified before Congress, been very active with organizations like MDMA and Advamed and the National Venture Capital Association, Association, NVCA, and really brings to this topic uh, just a whole lot of personal experience working with his companies, working with legislators from a time when Mike was just a lone voice in the wilderness to the point where today, where reimbursement is top of mind for everyone in the industry. So uh, this discussion will really go through kind of the, what we're calling the uh, reimbursement evolution to the point where it's become as critical today, um, both for companies, regulators, and for investors. So we hope you enjoy the discussion with Mike Carusi. And I wanna thank Mike and also, as always, thank Murad Kakish, who is our marketing expert, but also our technical guru, who gets these podcasts on the air for us each time. So, Murad, thanks. We could not do this without you. And with that, we hope you enjoy the discussion with Mike Carusi. So on today's edition of the Market Pathways podcast, we're privileged to have Mike Carusi. And Mike is uh, really one of the leading figures and has been for probably too many years, although I've got the gray hair. He has none. Um, I've to got show, some Steve. to show for it <laughs> in, in venture capital, but Mike has always had a, a unique, I'd say, insight in that he was, I think, one. Of, I think it's fair to say, Mike, you were one of the first VCs to really recognize and get involved with the importance of not only regulatory, um, because obviously regulatory was always top of mind for product companies and startups but also uh, reimbursement. So let me, let's me let start out by uh, talking about how you got into it, because it's not a logical uh, path. You, you know, your background is in engineering. And, you know, before you got into venture capital, uh, both at ATV and, and Lightstone, Advanced Technology Ventures and Lightstone. Um, and, and again, I, I think that you were a pioneer because uh, not a lot of venture capitalists recognized the importance, particularly of reimbursement. Um, so, so what attracted you to that area? 
Yeah. So, um, you know, if you look back, I got into venture in 1998. That's when I started with, with ATV. And as you said, before that I was engineering, I was also sales and, and marketing. Um, and so I started investing 1998, 99. And, um, uh, I have a colleague who joked that back in those days, I couldn't spell reimbursement. <laughs> and as, as the years went on, um, you know, I learned as reimbursement kind of evolved over those years that reimbursement was the big bugaboo. Obviously, we were dealing with FDA back in that 2008, 9, 10 period of time as well. But but reimbursement became a bigger and, and bigger issue. And so uh, like anything else, you know, um, obviously we try and solve these problems for our companies. And so I started to get engaged. And if you kind of look back in my involvement, I, I got involved with two others uh, who were even involved in, in these issues before me. And that was Ross Chaffee and, and Jack Lasserson. And so, um, and the three of us had actually connected with Anna Eshoo. And um, we were kind of- for the, Let me just, inter for people who don't know, Sorry. Anna is the retiring- congressperson who represents the bay area in silicon valley yeah so she's california 16 which is our district here and and it was at the time also um the enc so the energy and commerce committee she was the co-chair of the medical device caucus so very engaged in our issues and so we were having uh, dinner with anna and um we talked about the issues in the industry and reimbursement bubbled up and, and she wanted to gauge so, so long story short we started to kind of work on that issue we got engaged with Mark Leahy and MDMA. We also got involved with the team at AdvaMed and uh, 21st Century Cures was underway. And, and so we started to introduce some of the reimbursement topics as a part of that. And then it evolved from there, Steve. And um, uh, I got more formally involved on various, uh, the, the, the National Venture Capital Association, board of directors, you know, et cetera. So, but the early um, underpinnings of that were really trying to solve problems for our companies, which were really twofold. One was FDA and and one was reimbursement. So that's a great segue. Um, if you look at how, and we'll touch on regulatory, but really want to focus this conversation on reimbursement. If you go back not that many years, when I'm out talking to CEOs, particularly of startup companies, and if I brought up the topic of reimbursement, what I would frequently be told is, no, we don't have to really worry about that. That you know, That's something the strategics are going to handle when we get acquired. We just have to work on our, our product development. Um, now, I would suggest that has changed dramatically so that it's not only top of mind for companies, but you know, when uh, VCs are looking at potential, you know, investments for their portfolios, that I think has become one of the boxes that they expect to companies to check off. Not that they have to have a, a complete, you know, soup to nuts uh, regulatory path, but you better have an idea uh, how you're going to get paid for your device. Do you, is that accurate? And have you seen that change as well? A absolutely. Um and, and, and I would say, you know, Steve, in some cases, um, some firms will invest wanting to kind of know that you've thought about it and you've got uh, an answer. There are other firms, and we can talk about this, where they won't invest unless it's been resolved, right? So they're, they're depending on the firm. Um, it, but if you go back, and you're right, like if, um, if you go back to 2002, 2003, reimbursement wasn't really a thing, right? We didn't, again, that's when I couldn't spell it. Um, <laughs> And so if you ask yourself, well, what changed? I'd say it's two things. I think one, uh, it's not a secret that the acquirers no longer acquire, for the most part, I'm generalizing, but no longer acquire companies as readily pre-commercialization. So that meant as venture capitalists, we all had to evolve and get used to and learn how to take our companies into commercialization and how to build out commercialization and reimbursement became a core part of that. So again, it was front and center. If I compare that to biotech, you know, there's a lot of talk around drug pricing, but for the most part, we're still selling or taking our companies public phase one, phase two. So right. my biotech partners aren't thinking about, or at least involved day to day on commercialization. They think about it, but they're not involved. So that's one. Two, I just think the reimbursement uh, landscape has changed. It, it, it's tightened up quite a bit. And so back in those days, you would go down the 510K path and you would think that reimbursement would readily come. 
I think people understood if you were down the PMA path, um, you might have to go down that uh, path a little bit more. But it was a little bit more predictable. It was a little bit more transparent. Um, it just wasn't as challenging. And so I think both from the acquirer's point of view and the fact that our companies are getting acquired later, we're now living these issues day to day. And then two, the, the, the challenges and the pathway has just gotten much harder. Um, and that and that's put it front and center for, for venture capitalists. And, it, you know, it's funny, once we have an experience on a deal and we've lost money on a deal because of reimbursement, we all kind of recoil mm -hmm. and say, oh, I've seen this before. I don't want to live this again. And I, I think, you know, that happens sometimes in particular sectors that fall out of favor because you've, you've had a bad um, experience or it can happen because of a regulatory pathway or a reimbursement pathway, et cetera. You know, it's interesting because there are some people, and I think, again, I think the level of expertise within the device industry about reimbursement has grown dramatically. There was a time when it's almost like regulatory and reimbursement was one word. People Correct. said them together, and the focus really was regulatory. And again, understandable, because until you get your product cleared or approved, you know, there's no, the, there's no commercialization and reimbursement to even discuss. Focusing on regulatory for a minute, and we're roughly 15 years or so into Jeff Shuren's tenure at FDA. And I really have to credit Jeff with, uh, as you pointed out, he came in at a time when, you know, relations between the industry and uh, regulators, you know, were at a low point. Uh, there was little transparency or predictability. And, um, you know, starting with, let's say, going back to what people refer to as the Macauer report. But again, it was something that Josh Macauer, uh, who now runs, uh, you know, who co-founded Stanford Biodesign and now runs Stanford Biodesign. Um, it was reported that Josh will be the first one to say he did with the help of people like you and MDMA and Advamed and the MDCA and, and, you know, and others. There was a group effort really kind of spearheaded um, improvements at, at, um, at FDA. But I want to go back to some testimony that you delivered on the Hill back in 2014. And uh, I know people always hate when they get their testimony quoted back. To them. <laughs> but but I, I want to just highlight a couple of points that you made, because I think it's instructive to show our listeners kind of the improvements that have taken place, because you were talking about the regulatory front, talking about we have more work to do. And some of the areas you cited were continued focus on management improvement and reviews and improved training to ensure consistency and timeliness of reviews at FDA. And, and I have to point out that's even more important, I think, now post-COVID when you've brought on a lot of new reviewers, and, but people are still working at home. So um, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about that. But let me throw out another, a couple other things. You talked about streamlining the independent review board approval process, improving the IDE, investigational device exemption process, especially reducing unnecessary preclinical trial data and improving the process for undertaking first in human studies, which again, I think is something that FDA has done. So, you know, uh, I know I threw a lot at you in that in that question, but, you know, I thought it'd be a good, a good jumping off point to talk about the improvements that have taken place at FDA. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's, it, it, and there's a lot to unpack there. I, I think, for one, you're right. We used to talk about regulatory and reimbursement in the as one word, and that was because there was a presumption that if you got FDA approval, reimbursement came with it. We can talk about that down. You know that, that we've learned that's not the case. Right. If you unpack it and say, okay, let's start with FDA. Again, as we know, back in that 2008, 9, 10 time frame. Uh, there were a lot of challenges uh, and there was a lot of tension between the industry and, and FDA. And again, at its core, it came back to a lack of transparency, predictability, I'd say unreasonable uh, questions, which often came back to the reviewers being new or inexperienced. Um, and it, it, it unnecessarily um, delayed approvals. And, and part of the work I did in parallel to what Josh and Mark Deem and others were doing was put together some case studies where I, I just put together examples 
and this was uh, for NVCA, where products were approved in Europe and how far behind the U.S. was in making the case that patients were, were suffering. Jeff, to his credit, um, you know, listened, took on that feedback, and, and I would say really worked to improve things at FDA in, in a very positive way. So a number of those issues and those recommendations that we cited back in, in that testimony as part of the 21st Century Cures um, uh, review uh, have been implemented. And then Jeff went beyond that and started to put in place new initiatives, as we know, uh, including you know one that now ties into reimbursement and TAPS that, that we can talk about. So it's not lost on Jeff and the FDA that now reimbursement has become a challenge uh, to patients to access uh, devices. So I credit Jeff and the leadership at FDA for that. I think you're absolutely right. We're, we're drifting back a little bit in a few places in the sense that FDA lost a lot of folks during COVID um, or they're working at home. And so we have a little bit of the reviewer issue again. I'd say the difference is Jeff is and FDA is fully aware you know, of the issue um, and is trying to address it, whereas we had to educate them on the issue before. So they're not, they're not, a, they're not opposed to trying to fix it. But it's the reality of post-COVID and, and what not only FDA is dealing with, but a lot of you know businesses around around the country. So um, that is an issue. You know, there's the occasional example where we may be venturing into a new space, and again, the preclinical requirements can get um, a little bit heady. Um, and or there's still certain groups within FDA that are more challenging than others. But in general, it is much much improved. Um, and again, I credit Jeff for not only fixing things, but then really getting creative, uh, you know, around new ways to, to uh, um, uh, and new initiatives to, to improve things. And I think they're trying to address. You know, one of the things we've talked about, you know, the improvements that we've seen at FDA, um, now sh shifting to focus on reimbursement, I think it's important to acknowledge that the landscape in reimbursement is much more challenging than regulatory, which is not in any way to minimize the difficulties, but at least when you're talking about regulatory, you're really talking about kind of one agency. I mean, you know, whereas when you get into reimbursement at the risk of stating the obvious here, you're, you know, sometimes people think just CMS, but, you know, you have to factor in CMS, you have to factor the max, you know, the M Medicare administrative contractors, the regional groups, the private payers. Um, then you've got the coding, the whole coding process, like the, the CPT process, which, again, being run by AMA is, is a whole other bureaucracy to to, to get involved with. Um, so, you and, know, and you've got RUC and payment. <laughs> so you, you've got RUC and payment as well, which um, also touches on, on AMA. So, yeah, those those three pillars uh, are, are legs to the stool, coding, payment, coverage, and then there's multiple players in each. And the other thing that I, I think it's important is that, you know, with with Medufa, you had user fees, which really helped fund some, you know, uh, of the improvements uh, at, at FDA. You know, th there is no user fee program, and I think it's fair to say no appetite for, you know, uh, kind of creating a user fee program for CMS. And we know that CMS is under resourced i'll just say that now, that's not to say that there aren't better ways that they could allocate their existing resources so i i don't want to let them get off the hook completely but i i think it's fair to say there's also you know a a, a funding issue there um when you compare with fda um that it's that's something that needs to to be kept in mind and so, uh, so i think it's a big issue i'm just going to say steve that um sure. It's it's there's not unanimity on whether or not it's a good idea or a bad idea to have user fees as it relates to to, to CMS. Um, I will say when we were going through the MSIT process and it, it looked like it was going to get approved and then new administration and it, and it didn't. We did float the idea of user fees uh, tied at least to MSIT, right? To to try and at least uh, oversee that program. Mm -hmm. And again, not everybody's on board with that. Big companies have different views and small companies. So um, I don't want to overstate the level of enthusiasm for, right. for that approach. But it was one idea that we certainly thought about because I, I will acknowledge that I do think CMS is 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 under-resourced. And that's 
I think, part of the pushback on some of these um, initiatives. I think to your point, Medufa, um, with it comes resources, but also with it comes a clock, right? And so the, 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 the best example in my mind was the de novo pathway prior to, I forget which Medufa uh, review, but there was no clock on de novo. And so, you know, you'd go down that de novo pathway and then it would sit on somebody's desks for, for nine months. And so it really was not a good pathway. You, di you didn't want to be de novo. Now that there's a clock attached to de novo, um, I actually, and we actually, that's one of our filters. If we, if we like a de novo pathway because it's, it brings in things that are, that are potentially novel, not incremental, but a predictable pathway. That predictability and that pathway and that clock does not, ex it, it exists somewhat, but for the most part does not exist for uh, any of those various payer legs to the stool that we just talked about. And that's where we just have no predictability. And the other issue is, frankly, you take a, a something like transparency, there's, that, that doesn't require additional funds. That requires a kind of change in the mindset, so to speak, at uh, at, at CMS. And again, and, and it and sorry, and it took a little bit at FDA, right? The, right. You know, trying to get FDA to declare mm -hmm. if we hit this bar, are we good? And we still know the challenges around that. Payers, CMS, and all of the private payers will not give you that answer, right? It, it, it is the quintessential bring me a rock. You bring them a rock, and then it's, oh, well, bring me a brown rock. You bring them a brown rock. Bring me a brown, shiny rock, right? And you just keep kind of going back to the well because. They don't tell you what they want. They just tell you it's not good enough. And just tell us where the bar is. That, that, that's all we need to know. Um, but they're, they're very resistant. To, to, there's no mechanism to do that. Right. So you mentioned MSIT, and that's a good segue into kind of the current landscape in terms of what's happening from a reimbursement perspective. So MSIT was kind of a, an odd story. I mean, here you have a program that was languishing back you know in the obama administration it ha had its roots and then you know lo and behold it it just miraculously pops up seemingly out of nowhere in many people's minds at the end of the trump administration only to be repealed you know uh, by the by the biden administration so you know i i hate to flood people with uh with new acronyms but uh men's uh, M medicare coverage of innovative technology has kind of been replaced by or or succeeded by i'll say that um the proposed t-set uh program and we saw uh cms with a proposal back in june we still haven't seen the the final comments but um talk a little bit about your view of TSET is. Do you see it as an improvement over MSIT? You know, sh do you prefer going back to um, to MSIT? And what again? What's your initial initial take on again? What is now? We know it's not a final program yet, um, but just a proposal. Yeah. So it, it's funny because MSIT. So I mentioned that that dinner with Anna Eshu with Jack and 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 Ross and my efforts. That actually went all the way back again to 2013, 14, 15. That was those were some of the early kernels to MSIT. It wasn't called MSIT. Um, then it didn't have a name. And again, we we were doing um, uh, calls with uh, some of the big med tech companies, some of the startups, Abamed, MDMA, trying to kind of work through this. And and again, there was a lot of discussion because it reminded, um, particularly some of the bigger companies of again another acronym, Steve, but CED, right? So coverage with evidence development, which. Right. Uh, folks did not love. And so they were worried that, again, we had a, we didn't even have a name for it, but that really all we were proposing was to kind of institutionalize CED and that that would be used as a cudgel. And again, admittedly, the big companies are more resourced on, on reimbursement than the, the small companies. And so they were a little bit hesitant to, to go down this path. And so it was bubbling around for a while. Um, and again, I, others like Avamed and MDMA continued to evolve it. And then when the breakthrough um, definition came in as part of, uh, I think that was 21st Century Cures, but at least those efforts, that's what it started to tie into to MSIT. That's what started to tie into MSIT because we started to get some definitions around breakthrough, et cetera. Um, 
to answer your question, uh, you know, I think MSIT would have been a game changer. Um, it addresses the, one of the big problems we have in reimbursement. This is particularly for coding is you need to have data level one studies, et cetera, but you also need widespread use of your product. And that's an ambiguous term, right? Right. Well, how do you get widespread use if you're not getting paid? This, that's this, not, yeah, that's a this classic is the chicken and the egg, right? right. So, right. so you, you have AMA, you have the society saying we need to see widespread use or adoption. Again, what does that mean? But then they're not getting paid, and particularly if you have an alternative therapy, you're not you're not the only therapy in the particular indication. You know what's going to make them reach for your product. So we were that was the problem we were trying to solve for, and it's still a problem. If I look at MSIT, it would have helped to address that problem. Now there was concerns about it's going to open the floodgates. I think again CMS didn't have the resources. How do you operationalize it? And again, I think Mark Leahy and others we would acknowledge some of those things needed to be cleaned up. Yeah, and we were trying to clean those things up, um, but but it got turf. Hey, have you heard of Market Pathways? Market Pathways provides the most in-depth analysis you'll find of the changes happening in medical device regulation and reimbursement every day. They address the complexity in regulatory affairs and beyond by helping you digest and contextualize technical topics like Medicare and MDR. Visit mystrategist.com slash trial today to start your free five-day trial to Market Pathways. Again, that's mystrategist.com slash trial for five days of online access. Hi everyone, I'm Joey Brenneman from Offscript Health, and we are excited to introduce you to Offscript Health's latest podcast series called Before We Die, the world's best podcast about the med tech industry. Every day, advances in technology are providing new, less invasive options in healthcare. Many of them are born out of the idea that there has to be a better way. On this show, we will be talking with the rock star innovators and inventors of the med tech industry who felt the same way, which inspired them to create a new device or challenge a way that a procedure was done. And most people don't even know who they are. So download and subscribe to Before We Die, wherever you get your podcasts. You'll get full episodes every Tuesday and on Thursdays. You'll get our Lab Before Slab mini episodes where Sandy, John, and Craig geek out about the latest happenings in the med tech world. Who would have thought that medical innovation could be so riveting? T said, it's a good proposal. Um, it's one I, I know that I think we're all in favor of but it's not nearly as comprehensive of, as MSID. It really is a series of improvements, maybe a little bit like what we discussed with FDA, on the CED program, which is an existing program. So it's not a new program. In my mind, it really just maybe helps to streamline and improve CED, so coverage with evidence development, but it's not MSID, which was really a new pathway for novel breakthrough therapies that we could utilize for some period of time uh, as we're going out to try and prove widespread market adoption, get additional data if needed, et cetera. So I think T-set is, is good, but not sufficient. And there is, a, uh, there is legislation that has been, bipartisan legislation that has been put forth, H.R. 1691, which is a little bit more in keeping with the goals of, of MSIT and is something that uh, I know I'm very supportive of, and, and again, I think the industry is very supportive of, and in, in trying to uh, advance that bipartisan uh, legislation. That will get us sort of back to where we where we were. Again, recognizing it needs to get tightened up. It was some of the elements of MSIT were vague, uh, and I, I've got some um, sympathy for, for for CMS around that. I want to touch on the legislation, but I want to delve a little bit more into. Tisa, because I think you make an important point, which is that instead of establishing um, a new coverage pathway, I mean, in its proposal, and again, I want to emphasize, this is still only a, a proposal, um, CMS essentially stayed within the bounds of the current NCD, the National Coverage right. um, you know, Determination Framework. I guess it's fair to say they're kind of front-loading 
um, the NCD application process for, but just for select, and I think that's important, select breakthrough devices. So it's not automatic no. for every breakthrough device to accelerate the, the data review and then, you know, getting the whole fit for purpose um, studies. Um, but but talk about, you know, what that means. In other words, it, the fact that that's a, a goal, for example, not a requirement that they, it, you know, how how much of an impediment do you see that, you know, to the kind of making this a kind of a widespread uh, program? Oh, I think it is an impediment. I, and again, I'll start to get out over my my skis here. There's people that are more expert into the into the details. But um, yeah, you're right. My understanding, Steve, is it really is only like five, right? Maybe ten. It's a handful uh, of products that would qualify. It's not entirely clear, at least to me, what the criteria are to qualify. It talks about breakthrough, but again, there's there's more than five or ten a year that are breakthrough. So. How are they going to select? And, and again, I think this has been a lot of the feedback from the industry. Like we need more uh, definition, transparency, understanding of the processes and definitions. But it's, it's. I think the point is it's going to be limited. It's not going to apply broadly. Um, and it's just not clear how that's going to be implemented. So again, for I, I think it's an improvement for those companies that want to go down the CED or have to go down the CED pathway and and are accepted into the to the program assuming it goes forward you know there's some discussions and some debate as well around does this now force you down a national coverage decision pathway and, and as you know there's pros and cons to that versus the local coverage decision pathway one mac at a time again i'm starting to come up against my level of expertise but how does that play into the, the attractiveness of using this program um because is it really bringing you down that national coverage decision one and done, but also one and miss, right, where you're out. Um, so I think there's a lot of subtleties to it. And like anything else, it's going to be nuanced. And, you know, it, um, uh, reimbursement consultants will make money because um, sure. <laughs> we're going to need to consult with folks that that understand the ins and outs of, of, of the, of the, of the uh, initiative. I don't I want to get too too far into the weeds because, again, you can get, you really can get lost in this whole thing. But let me highlight a couple of other points that that have prompted some concern one is the failure to include diagnostics and i don't know to what extent um at lightstone you know you've gotten involved in bringing light in uh diagnostic companies into your portfolio but certainly after the pandemic i mean i think it's fair to say diagnostics have have attracted renewed interest and the other is is this requirement that uh, potentially companies would need to disclose um in, information to to the max um, and and um, again, having to reveal uh, potentially sensitive information might uh, discourage a lot of companies from participating. So do you have a perspective on either of those? No, I think both fair. I, uh, so Lightstone is not a uh, we, we've done you know one or two uh, diagnostic investments, but not a major area of focus for us. But with that said, yes, it's excluded and I don't understand why. Um, so again, it's not clear how they, came up with the opportunity set as to who might qualify and, and why or why not diagnostics was excluded. And, and yes, you're also correct. There is information requirements um, um, that uh, the industry is concerned could, could be used against you down the road or uh, get out to others or potentially competitors, et cetera. So I would say like anything else, the devil's in the details and the details are not at least from my perspective and right. the industry's perspective, I think the idea of TSET is an improvement over what exists today, but the, the devil's in the details and the details need to be improved. Is, so is, is the, good was... segue into, uh, you mentioned the legislation. Some people are now suggesting that maybe the solution doesn't lie with CMS and that ultimately really the industry needs to look to Congress to adopt this legislation and, and have that be the means by which a MSIT slash TSET type uh, proposal is ultimately um, ad adopted. You've had, again, we talked about your testimony back in, in 2014. So, you know, you have, you know, a sense of, 
uh, what's going on, on on the Hill, although arguably in the 10 years since then, since things have gotten even more chaotic than, yeah. than, than they were back then. So I'm not going to ask you to make a prediction, but, but do you have a sense as to whether uh, a legislative solution may be more likely or, or more effective from an industry perspective than the proposal that CMS put out? Well, again, TSET uh, is a little bit s- separate from this bill in the sense that this bill looks more like MSIT, right? right. So, so it, it it's kind of trying to go back to the MSIT um, framework. So, my understanding, Steve. So, b- back even as we were having these discussions as early as 2014, um, one of the challenges that that CMS used to cite is that they are constrained. <laughs> by current legislation and what they can and can't do. And this, we used to have a lot of discussion around reasonable and necessary and and some of the terms that are codified in the current legislation. And CMS uh, would note that that limits what they can do without uh, changes to the legislation or Congress enabling them to do so. So a lot of these programs were kind of developed with that as a constraint and trying to work within what we thought CMS could do as a um, uh, initiative within CMS versus requiring new legislation. So the push for legislation isn't simply because CMS might be reticent or not want to do it. It, I, I think there is some truth to the fact that they are constrained. And so this is an acknowledgement that maybe we can um, unconstrain some of the the things that we're trying to operate within if we come forth with new legislation. So that's a little bit of the backdrop as to why this isn't just political. This actually might try and help um, unfreeze things uh, Mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, You know, in terms of whether or not it'll pass and so forth, you know, there's a number. Obviously, we're in a challenging environment with Congress. As I said, this does have bipartisan support, um, Democrat and Republican sponsored. The challenge with these kind of bills is they often have to get attached to, to something else, right? It's, right? it's too small in and of itself. I want to wrap up by kind of going back up to 30,000 feet. We've kind of gotten into the weeds a little bit, which is which is critically important in, in this area. But I want to talk a little bit about the international landscape. Um, you've been involved internationally with two of the countries that really have developed leading medtech ecosystems, and those are Ireland and Singapore. Um, and I also kind of want to add to that what we've seen over the last few years with the implementation of the new medical device regulation in Europe, which mm-hmm. has really, from my view, reversed what was the traditional trend of companies from the U.S. and from outside of Europe looking to Europe first, getting CE Mark first, commercializing there early, generating early clinical data and maybe some early revenue as well. And now it seems that companies from throughout the world are are looking to the U.S. first. And I think it's not just MDR. I think it's also the improvements that we've talked about at FDA that have also kind of made this possible. But does that add to the pressure for uh, improving the reimbursement pathway? Because again, we've talked about how critical reimbursement is to med tech development. And without the reimbursement pathway, you know, even the improvements at FDA, you know, could slow down, as you just mentioned, uh, talking about the, the Stanford study um adoption of, of innovative new technologies it, it, it does this is a, this is a, this could be a long discussion so um you know no question mdr reverses some of the um advantages of ce mark and, and others to get to market sooner in europe so i will tell you at least lightstone's perspective has always been that commercializing in europe i'm generalizing uh, let's, let's say for a new device where it's a market development effort commercializing in Europe without having those broader, more robust studies 
and we kind of skipped over this, this part of where regulatory and reimbursement diverged, which is the studies that are required for regulatory are not necessarily the studies required for reimbursement, right? So th this is why it's all kind of bifurcated. Our belief is that without those studies in hand, which you may not get in terms of what was required for its CE mark, it's going to be very hard to commercialize in Europe, and it's probably ultimately a net use of cash, not a net return of cash, and it's a distraction. So we never viewed Europe, and again, I'm generalizing there. If you have an established market in Europe, I might say something different, but for truly novel products, we never felt, felt that a European commercialization strategy was one that you could count on for revenues, et cetera. There were other advantages, early access to patients, thought leaders, um, uh, et cetera. So there, there were advantages. Now, FDA is trying to catch up in that regard with the EFS, right, the early feasibility study and some of those advantages that Europe, that Europe brings. So I don't know that MDR in and of itself puts more pressure on reimbursement because at the end of the day, and again, this is Lightstone's perspective, it is all about generating the right clinical data and generating the clinical, and this has been the big learning over the past, at least for me, over the past 10 to 15 years, generating the right data as soon as possible for reimbursement and understanding that that's not always what's required for FDA. So for example, FDA often likes to see a sham control. Right. Payers often like to see it compared to standard of care, right? Do you run that in all one big study? Do you run it in separate studies? This is some of the effort with TAPS, et cetera, right? How do, you, how do you at least try and bring these two worlds closer together so you're not running 26 studies, right? And you're running one for CMS and one for Aetna and one for United and one for FDA. That's where all of this has become very challenging because of all the players. So to me, it comes back to the clinical data, generating the right clinical data. And that data is required in Europe as, as much as it is in in the U.S., clinicians in Europe don't want to see any less data than clinicians in the in the U.S. No, and, and arguably MDR requires more clinical data now than previously. Correct. Where it hurts you is the ability to get into patients sooner and some of that early feasibility work. So, uh, so I don't think it's a commercialization revenue impact, but it does hurt you on the early access to to, to patients and doing some of that early feasibility work. Uh, where, admittedly, it was a lower bar. Um, uh, and a lot of that bar was lower around preclinical testing, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So that has been elevated. And so is Europe as attractive now for early feasibility work as it once was? No. And that's because of MDR. But I think that's separate and independent from the, the commercialization question. So let's wrap up by kind of looking back on your experience in this area, and I'm going to put regulatory and reimbursement back together as one word. Um, you really were, again, one of the pioneers uh, in, in the industry, again, working with many others um, to really generate progress at FDA on a number of fronts, as we talked about, accountability, transparency, uh, timeliness. Are you optimistic about the prospects for seeing similar improvements on the reimbursement front, broadly speaking? I am. Uh, I pause a little bit because to your point, Steve, there's more parties you need to influence. So I would say that I am optimistic in our ability to work with CMS and to come up with improvements, let's put it that way, be it TSET, um, HR 1691, et cetera, that help us with CMS. That doesn't address the whole private payer sure. landscape. And that is a much harder um, nut to crack because you've got a lot of different motivations and a lot of different folks that you need to work through. So it's a much harder problem to solve. Uh, that's not to say I'm not optimistic. That, I, I would say what's different, at least speaking for myself, is I've now got enough um, arrows in my back that I understand what we did wrong and what's required. And so I have a better understanding as a board member and investor in my companies as to what we have to do to get reimbursement um, with some of these players. And uh, it's multifaceted. Data is a part of it, but there's a number of other elements, right? And so 
I think I and we and the industry has a better understanding, which if you have a better understanding, then you're less afraid of it um, and you feel more confident that you can address it. But I think the private payer piece of this, just again, because you're dealing with so many different entities, is hard. Uh, but I am optimistic that CMS, I mean, ultimately, I think they want to do right by patients and right by um, their patient population. So I think they have the right motivation and it's it's one it's one entity we're dealing with. Um, beyond that is it, hard. And and but I also tell you that, you know, there's been other learnings. Right. So I've kind of uh, learned in the procedure based areas, CPT, et cetera. But we've kind of ventured into wearables. Right? These are a uh, different pathway now. DME, right? It's a whole different learning. And, and the stuff that applied to CPT and everything else is different. And Medicare and CMS is trying to, and the Macs are trying to figure out how to, to, to deal with these. And we've seen it with the digital therapies, right? The pairs of the world that reimbursement has really hurt uh, those therapies and their adoption and their ability to get, because they weren't getting paid for it. So just because we're learning in one sliver, as some of these other uh, therapeutic areas emerge, it's all it's it's learning all over again, and often it's it's CMS learning in parallel. So um, it's challenging as a result. But and again, that's no different than FDA kind of learning how do we regulate this, that, or the other. But it, it apply it applies to, to CMS too. That that the pathway for putting a stent in. And all the reimbursement that's required around that is different than the pathway for a therapeutic wearable or some of these other products. Um, and, and I would just flag that as there's opportunity to continue to learn in, in this in this space because it's something new every day. And it also reflects just how broad, when you talk about the medical device industry, and, and frankly, with digital and now with AI, I mean, it, it's only getting broader, not narrower. So uh, there's only more to learn. And again, it's as difficult as it is for industry, regulators also, have, and again, one of the, the problems is that regulators typically lag behind industry right. in their learning curve. So uh, that makes it you know more challenging for them. But I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, take uh, moderator's liberty and, and say you're ending on a, glass half full note <laughs> at least that gives us a, an optimistic perspective mike i want to thank you so much for your time i know this is not the last time that we will touch on this topic which will obviously continue to be of paramount importance to both investors and to product companies so thank you very much thanks steve i appreciate it and i appreciate the, the work you guys are doing to, to keep it front and center for everybody so thank you thanks we hope you enjoyed that discussion with Mike Carusi. Mike certainly brings a unique perspective. He's one of the few investors who's been able to kind of capture the historical evolution of reimbursement in medtech from a time when he was one of the lone voices in the wilderness to the point where now it's really top of mind for both product companies and investors, as well as for regulators and private insurers. So it's certainly a complex issue that uh, we will continue to focus on both here on the podcast, as well as in our publication, Market Pathways. I'd encourage you to take a listen to past podcasts in our archives and also delve into the in-depth coverage we provide of MedTech regulatory reimbursement and policy issues every month in market pathways. So with that, let me again, thank Mike and also thank Murad without whom these podcasts would not be possible. He makes us sound a lot better on the podcast than we do in real life. And, and we appreciate that. And so we wanna hope you enjoyed this edition of the podcast and look forward to sharing future editions with you. Thanks. We hope you enjoyed that episode. Your support is valuable and makes us better. Please remember to leave a review and rate Market Pathways on Apple Podcasts or wherever you happen to listen.